Hey guys, this is Sandy White from Simply Fit, your number one health and wellness cheerleader and the host of Simply Fit. We've got Patient Lee on today. But before we get into all of the juiciness, guys, I want to thank WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network for allowing Simply Fit to be on their platform again. Because guys, without their support, without your support, we couldn't do what our mission is, which is to save one million lives by encouraging individuals to live a Simply Fit life through health and nutrition. And we simply do that by giving you guys all the simple tips and strategies that you can use in your health and in your wellness. And this allows you to overcome suicide and depression. So again, thank you WYTV7 for allowing Simply Fit to come on to the platform to share with the audience. Hey guys, go on to the website wytv7.org and check out all of the other broadcasters that are on here because there's something that you could use right now or you can share with someone that you love. And there's a plethora of other things that we're doing, so check out what we're doing in the neighborhood. See what works for you now or what you can share with someone else. So with that being said, let me introduce uh, Patient Lee as he's Oh, so eloquently known by um, Lee Tomlinson is on a life mission, guys, and he's known as Patient Lee, and he's on the mission to inspire healthcare professionals to return compassionate care to its rightful place at the forefront of modern healthcare to benefit patients, their families, the bottom line, and perhaps most importantly they're often suffering burned out selves. Finding this mission wasn't, wasn't uh, easy for, for Patient Lee. He's an award-winning television producer, movie studio executive, and, former, and, a, and a former professional athlete, speaker, and TED Talk presenter. <laughs> Patient Lee is alive today due to the combination of lifetime of extraordinary effective care of medical treatment and deeply kind compassionate care unfortunately during a recent battle with stage three throat cancer patient lee became patient painfully aware of the traumatic cause that treatment lacking in compassion that drove him to the darkest of his death which saved uh, what saved him from suicide was a tiny, simple, yet powerful act of compassion delivered by a loving doctor and a kind friend. And this sparked him to create Compassion Heals Movement. So welcome to the show, Patient Lee. Well, thank you. You? Um, you know, I got to tell you something. When you read that introduction, it makes me feel really old. But um, the good news is, the good news is, despite all of those medical interventions, uh, I am alive. And it's due to the extraordinary skills and hearts of healthcare professionals that I'm alive today. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here at my age and with my history, I'm thrilled to be anywhere. Oh, well, amen to that. So I got a quick question. Tell everybody why you want to be known as Patient Lee. Well, I don't know that I want to be, but that's what my patient, that's what my patients, that's what my audiences call me. And the reason is, is that well, I've done what? Um, since my recovery, probably over 200 keynotes around the world. And I always do them, mostly to medical professionals, but others as well, in a patient's gown with my you-know-what hanging out the back. Um, and I have to say, it gets their attention and reminds them that this talk is about the impact of compassion on patients when it's present and the horrible consequences that follow when it's not. So they call me patient Lee because that's my perspective. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist. What I am is a lifelong patient and a student of compassion. And it's your perspective on how it is and which it's, it's, and it's not, it has nothing to do with the pandemic. I think it's just overall in general. And I, and I like the part where you said that the compassion a lot of times needs to go to 
the caregivers because they're burned out. And when you're burned out, then you start doing stuff because you're stressed out, you're tired. Instead of recognizing this, you take it out on the person that needs the most help, and, and that's sad. Um, l let me ask you this. What, based off of your experience going through uh, cancer is what caused you to write the book, but tell the audience a little bit more about com the Compassion Heals movement. Well, I mean, basically, uh, when I was being treated for cancer, uh, at the very end of my treatment, when I was in absolute total misery, I thought I was a pretty tough guy. You know, they're going to give me some medicine for three months, some chemo. They're going to give me some shots of radiation to the tumor. I mean, how bad could that be? Well, if you took all of those hospitalizations in six different countries, a dozen broken bones, um, had my thumb pulled off, skin grass, bone grass, if you took all of that and added it up, it wouldn't begin to equal the pain and suffering I had while being treated for cancer. And at the very end of my treatment, I'd lost 60 pounds, um, didn't know if I would live, didn't know if I'd be able to speak because there was talk of surgery to remove my tongue, which for a studio executive doesn't work. Right. Um, and so I said, no, we're not doing that, guys. So unless we're desperate, um, but we were getting close and maybe we were desperate. So the long and the short of it is, is that I was hospitalized with an unidentifiable septic infection um, at the very end of my treatment. So now I'm in the hospital, I'm dying of cancer. I have no reason to believe my treatment's working at all. Um, I have a septic infection that's likely to kill me before uh, the cancer does. I hadn't worked. I was running up gigantic bills. And like you said, when people are in pain, they tend to take it out on others. And my partners, and in particular, my wife, um, I did just that. So I was, my marriage was on the rocks for 30 years. All I needed in that hospital was a little bit of kindness, a little bit of politeness, a little bit of caring and compassion, and I got zero. And I realized, not consciously, but I realized what that did was if these people in whose hands I put my life think I am so worthless and unworthy of simple human kindness, they must be right because I give them the power of life or death. They're like gods to me. And so I realized, well, if they think that, you know what? They're right. I'm a jerk. I'm losing money. I'm ruining my family. I'm ruining my marriage, my business, my partners, everything. The world would be a better place without me. And I put together a plan to put on enough fentanyl patches. I had unlimited amounts to try and dull the pain, um, go to sleep and let my family collect a huge key man life insurance policy at the studio, which was a ton of money and let them live like kings and queens. What a great parting gift. And I would have done that unless the day after I got out of the hospital, as I was figuring this plan out, a doctor friend came to visit and he sat down next to me and I it was very painful for me to even speak. My throat was swollen, you know, uh, terrible burns from the radiation. But I managed to tell him all my complaints from this hospital from L, and he did some remarkable things. One is he reached out and put his hand on my arm to connect with me. He looked me straight in the eye, lowered his head and said, Lee, I am so, so, so sorry for the lack of compassion you've experienced in this hospital. He said it is absolutely unforgivable. And he said, the worst problem is you're not the only one. It's happening more and more and more in healthcare, and I am so sorry. And then he said, but you know, rather than doing yourself in, how about this? How about you fight? And if you're lucky, and if you live, how about you do something to return this compassion, which is disappearing from healthcare today, and see if you can't reverse that. And in that moment, his kindness, his caring, his belief and trust that I could make a difference in a problem that big inspired me to fight and is the reason I'm alive today. And the result of that is the Compassion Heals movement, which is dedicated to returning the rapidly disappearing presence 
of the healing power of compassion to better heal patients and their way too often burned out providers who treat them. So that's how it came to be. And the name of the book is Compassion Heals from Self-Care to Healthcare. Because most of my message is not to beat up healthcare workers and say, you guys are bad guys, meaning you almost killed me. No, I realized that over 60% of healthcare workers on a good day, much higher now during COVID, because they give and give and give and never look after their own health, they get burned out. And one of the characteristics of burnout is emotional numbness which means despite the fact that providing compassion for your patients has been scientifically determined to be an absolute necessity for the best outcomes for your patients, they can't do it when they're burned out. And so we need to support them and their organizations, which oftentimes value profit over patients or providers We need to support them in being healthy so they can be their strongest selves and be both competent and compassionate when we patients need it the most. Long answer to a short question. No, 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 no. no. No, Kind of how it happened. No, no, no. That's really good because it explains why you're such an advocate for um, healthcare providers. But in that, I heard um, it, it started off sounding like hurt people hurt, you know, continue to hurt people. But it's a little bit more than that. It's neglected people hurt people. Because when you neglect yourself, you're hurting yourself. And you take it out on folks that, you know, really need it the most. And it's not, and and also, also on top of that, you just can't function at all when you're exhausted. And so let me ask you this. Are you, um in a position where you can go to different hospitals to share the uh, message of, of, you know, hey guys, you know, we appreciate what you're doing, but working, and this reminds me, I'm going to get back to the point, but it reminds me of why um, pilots can't do what they do anymore, because they were operating just like healthcare providers. They were flying, 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 and you had crash after crash, and they were getting inebriated, and now you see this happening in the healthcare facilities, and now what, and I hope you're going to tell me this answer, that they're going to eventually tell them 10 hours is the max, and then you have to go home, like firefighters. You have to be on for so many days and off for so many days. So in your advocacy for healthcare providers to do better and to take care of themselves, is that something that's on the rise? Yes, absolutely, that's true. And part of my mission is to advocate for more compassion for the people who work for those healthcare organizations. Look, The reason why they don't let a pilot fly after a certain amount of hours and there is mandatory rest in between flights is because you make more mistakes when you're flying an airplane um, if you're not fully rested. Well, guess what? When you're burned out in healthcare, your level of competency, you make vastly more medical mistakes. So not only are you not providing your patients with the compassion that's an essential component of healing, but you're not supplying them with professional levels of treatment as well. So not only when you burn out, do you kill yourself in healthcare or a pilot or um, EMT or anybody else, but you end up killing your patients. And for people who are in the business and it is a business, no money, no mission, but who are in the calling of healthcare, the reason they got into it, the vast majority of them, except for the ones where their mom and dad said, you better get into healthcare or I'm gonna, anyway, but most of them got in because they have a very, very, very huge heart and they have nothing more important to them than realizing and feeling the pain deeply of others and feeling deeply moved and motivated to do whatever they can to heal them. So when they burn out, they're violating that initial uh, commitment that they made to their patients. And so my job, and gosh, I've done a couple of hundred keynotes, 
to those healthcare professionals is yes, we're going to talk about, you know, improving the compassion for your patients. But at the end of the day, at the end of my keynotes, what I'm talking about is self care. It's not self indulgent. It's not self important. It is, in fact, a necessity. They deserve it. And I advocate not only for that with them, so that they can start taking healthy steps to get healthy again and stay healthy, but also with their organizations in Congress, uh, the government, to say, we've got to start loving and caring for our healthcare professionals as much as we do our patients. Right. So both of those are part of my mission to bring it back for the benefit of everybody. In fact, the most successful healthcare organizations on a business side are those that have the best care for their patients. Why? Happy patients <laughs> come back again and again and recommend you to everybody. It, it increases right. the well, bottom well, line. Hopefully you won't come back as a happy patient. You'll stay out. But guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to be back with Patient Lee. All right, guys. One second. We'll be back. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And if you're a woman who's been impacted by this illness, you welcome the focus and the opportunity to learn more. I'm Carol Laurie. I am a naturopath, acupuncturist, and homeopath. And the focus of my clinical practice in my online community is to provide women such as yourself with the natural and integrative tools so you can get through treatment with reduced side effects and then move on to recover your health and know that you are doing everything possible to prevent your current recurrence. I've developed an online group coaching program, Empowered Against Recurrence. And during the month of October, I'm offering this at a reduced fee because I want all of you to have these natural and integrative tools to make them part of your life. So in the middle of the night, when there's that little voice that shows up and says, what if it comes back? You know that you're doing everything possible taking the medical oncology with the natural and integrative science-backed tools to reduce your risk of recurrence. You can learn all about my upcoming program by going to www.empoweredagainstrecurrence.com. I hope to see you at one of my free classes offered throughout the month of October. This is Carol Laurie signing off for now. Hope you all have a wonderful day and there'll be more later. Take care, everyone. Hey guys, I'm Sandy White from Simply Fit, your number one health and wellness cheerleader. I hope you enjoyed our commercial. The first half of our segment, we were talking with Patient Lee, and he brought up a really good point, self-care. Whether you are uh, in the medical profession or not, you have to do self-care. Because as a mom, a dad, especially you moms out there, we wear 9,000 different hats, and we get burned out just like he was saying. And then we want to act like the Incredible Hulk because somebody didn't take the trash out. Take time to take care of yourself. But now, Lee, I want to um, bring back a, a point that you made about the way you were feeling in the hospital and you want patients to be happy so they can return. Well, we don't want them to return. But what I was thinking of when you said that before the commercial break, if I was your close friend during the time you were going back and forth in the hospital, uh, getting recovered, you know, procedures to recover from uh, your, your stage three cancer, and I had a challenge based off of what you shared with me, probably would have made me feel extremely anxious about going to see any type of, of medical professional. And, and God forbid that anybody has experienced this or they're going through it now. What um, Lee is explaining, better, better health care, self-care, so that they can give more compassion to the folks that are coming to the hospital because if you have somebody sharing their negative experience and you need to go most likely you won't go and then you end up making the situation worse or even dying from it and i, I i'm going to bring this up because that actually actually that actually happened 
to my sister. She actually, in my opinion, I don't think she would have died had she not been afraid. She was Aww. not so afraid to go to the hospital. She passed away um, a little bit before Christmas uh, last year from COVID because Aww. she was so afraid to go to the hospital. And one of the reasons is because of what you are explaining right now. Horrendous experience from people that she knew. She just did not want to go. And she had been in back and forth and the care was horrible and she just in her mind which a lot of people think I'm better off if I stay at home I'm not feeling well and I don't need this added stress so you know I, I just want to thank you and I don't want to get all choked up but I, I thank you for the advocacy that you're doing because the guys that are in the healthcare, they're burnt out, like you said. They're tired, they're exhausted. But when you get to that point, you have to open your mouth and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Supervisor, I am not functioning at my best. I am treating the patients like dog food, like trash. Please take me off the clock. And again, just like you said, that's when you start having a lot of mistakes and, and malpractice too. So let me ask you this. What were you doing prior to, I mean, you were doing a plethora of things, but prior to the, the situation going into the hospital, what were you doing? Like, what was well, your life like? First of all, I, I got to say, I love the word plethora. Um, I don't think I've used it in 50 years, but it's a great word. Um, so before I got cancer, I was a... Um, uh, an award-winning television producer for CBS and the American Film Institute, did a decade of award-winning shows, uh, primetime specials. Um, we owned uh, the famed Culver Studios in Los Angeles. We developed and built Albuquerque Studios um, before that. Um, and I raised a significant amount of money on behalf of the U.S. Olympic Committee um, as well. So I've had, and then I was a professional athlete, tennis player before that, but uh, that was fun. Uh, the rest was work. Um, so that's really, it had nothing to do with healthcare other than the fact that I was a perpetual patient. Um, so the last thing I wanted to be was doing what I'm doing, but the opportunity presented itself and I saw the need. And what makes me even more sad, first of all, about your sister and my deep, deep, deep condolences. The healthcare system is excellent. Having said that, it's not as good as it could be. I recommend everybody go seek out a healthcare professional. And if they, you're never going to know if they're competent medically. How would you know? I mean, I don't know if sutures are done this way. Who knows? But if they're not kind, caring, and compassionate in their interactions with you, if you don't feel seen, heard, and appreciated, find another doctor. It is that important to your recovery. So if you've got a choice, take it and interview. You're putting your life in those people. Even it's simple. You're putting your life in those people's hands. You want the best there is. The only thing you can judge is how they interact with you. And if they don't do it in a kind, caring, and loving way, you will be damaged by that. And sometimes it can cost you your life like it almost did me. I, I have to um, ask you, uh, because that was really good. Um, in the interacting, when you first meet the doctor, if they suck, believe them. Believe what's right and move out. <laughs> So, so what with the relationship between Compassion Hill and today's medical care, what should it look like or what is it on the path to be? Well, it's, it's actually fairly simple. There's a, a test that all Medicare patients are given. It's called an HCAP score. And what it does is it allows you to grade, not the treatment you got, because who can judge whether the operation was right, wrong, or in between, but it allows you to judge and rate the care that you get. What we need is a healthcare system nationally that evaluates hospitals and medical groups much more closely and rewards those that are more compassionate and get higher ratings on that HCAP score, give them a higher amount of refunds and all of that sort of stuff, and give less to the ones that don't to force them 
to begin to take better care of their people, their providers, and ultimately their patients. So, now, go ahead. Say that is HCAP. HCAPS. H C A H P S. So is that so? Do you ask your healthcare provider for the link? Do you no. write them or you? No. Yeah, actually, HCAP scores are for Medicare and Medi-Cal uh, patients. Unfortunately, um, most healthcare providers don't provide a questionnaire at the end that has measurable impact against it that prevents or encourages them to do much of anything, gives them feedback. But when you consider that 50%, listen to this, 50% of people who have medical interventions today say they receive zero kindness and compassion during their medical interventions. That means half of all of the patients in America every single day do not get a critical healing medicine that is necessary for the best outcome. As, with all due respect, that's malpractice. Yeah. You know, if that was... It, it is. And I have to say, and I'm probably biased, I think my experience in the hospital, I, I've never had to go and stay other than when I had my children, um, because I, I was like 216 with the first one, 220, barely walking. And But my sister-in-law was in labor and delivery, and she decided, I'm not going to leave until you guys determine how many kids you want to have, and I'll stay here. And the sad thing is, she did that because of what you're talking about now. She knew that the people that were there weren't going to provide me with the proper care that I needed. And that's so sad. But I think I got the care that I got, as I said, because they didn't want their co-workers seeing them in a, in a different light, which is you know, it was good for me, horrible for them. But you, but but I'm I, I'm so grateful for you being an advocate for uh, healthcare professionals doing better. We're down to our last five minutes, guys. So I'm going to ask Lee to tell us how you can get in touch with him, where to get his book from, and then how you can participate in the mission that he's on. So take it away, Lee. All right. Well, so I'm going to I'm going to answer both questions uh, with one answer. What I do with my audiences when I speak and do my keynotes, at the very end, it's all just talk unless people take action. So here's what we need to do. If what we want to do is to change the world and bring it back to the interconnectedness that it was before all this craziness, we need to take action. So go to my website, www.lee, L-E-E, Tomlinson, T O M. L-I-N-S-O-N, T-O-M, L-I-N-S-O-N, and take the Compassion Heals Challenge. Sign up and take it. All it asks you to do is for the next seven days after you sign up to commit to doing one small kind act a day. One, just one for seven days. At the end, and we'll support you and send you messages every day to remind you, at the end of it, We'll give you a free digital copy of the book. You don't even have to buy it. All you have to do is rather than complaining about the problem, is do something to improve the world by bringing more kindness in, by committing yourself seven days, I'm going to do a kind act. And those little kind acts can sometimes mean the difference between life and death for the recipients of those gifts. So go online, get a free book. Yeah, I love that. This thing, it's, it's, uh, it's, it brought me back to uh, my remembrance of the 40-day fire walk challenge where you have to do something nice every day for your spouse. And let me ask you this real quick. Yes. Do you have your book near you where you can hold it up? Um, uh, uh, no. That's okay. <laughs> I got everything else in the world around me. That's okay. Oh, right. no. Go sign up on the website. Take the seven-day challenge and yes. get a copy yes. of the book. Yes. Lee, we have enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for being an advocate. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so happy you're doing so much better. 
I am. Knock on wood. <laughs> yes. Guys, if you missed the first part, just go back and check it out. We've been talking to Lee Tomlinson, patient Lee, as his uh, patients and friends call him. Guys, he has the Compassion Hill book. I'm Sandy White, your number one health and wellness cheerleader and the host of Simply Fit. We broadcast every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. So check, check your time zone so you don't miss any of these wonderful segments. Until next Wednesday, we'll see you later. And thank you, Lee, for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you.